Blog Talk Radio. Paranormal Review Radio. commercials and with more great paranormal talk. Thank you for joining us tonight. I'm Anthony Agati in New York. And I'm Lucy Leapfried in Chicago. Are you ready for another Paranormal Friday night? Thank you all for joining us tonight. We welcome our regular listeners and those of you who have tuned in for the very first time. If you have a question for our guest or about the topic tonight, feel free to ask us in the chat room or call in to the show at 661 644-9831. Please press the number 1 to speak to the host. Don't forget, you can always send us an email with future topics that you'd like to see on the show or if you have a story or a theory that you want to share with us on air. Our email address is paranormalreviewradio at yahoo.com. We also have our own YouTube channel where you can listen to all of our previous shows. Now, Don't forget to check us out on our Facebook show page for more information on the paranormal and upcoming shows. Our guest tonight is Lloyd Arabach, the Director of of Office of Paranormal Investigations and President of the Forever Family Foundation, and is one of the world's leading experts on psychic experience and ghosts. Mr. Arabach has been investigating and researching the paranormal for over 34 years. He's the author of eight books, the most recent being the Ghost Detective's Guide to Haunted San Francisco. His next release will be ESP Wars, East and West, covering the psychic spying programs of the U.S. and Soviet Union Russia, which I believe is due out at the end of this month. With a graduate degree in parapsychology, Lloyd is a professor at both Atlantic University and JFK University on the faculty of the Rhine Education Center and is the creator and instructor of the certificate program in parapsychological studies at HCH Institute in Lafayette, California, which is also available for distance learning or in coaching form. He is on the board of directors of the Rhine Research Center and is on the advisory boards of the Winbridge Institute and the Forever Family Foundation. Whew. Man, this guy is just amazing. If that's not enough, he's also made appearances on Larry King Live, The View, Ghost Adventures, and Unsolved Mysteries, just to name only a few. I'm sure many will love this side of Lloyd. He is also a professional chocolatier, producing and selling his chocolate on his website, hauntedbychocolate.com. Mr. Arabach has graciously accepted our invite to come on the show and talk with us, and Lucy and I are excited to talk to this man, and then we've actually followed, his, followed him most of his career in the paranormal. If you think you know everything about the paranormal, we may burst your bubble tonight. Sit back, open your minds, and allow the knowledge you learned tonight to be accepted. It's going to be a great discussion. Please help me in welcoming Professor Lloyd Arabach to the show. Hello, Professor. Glad to have you on. Thanks very much. Welcome, Professor. I'm so glad that we're talking with you tonight about the importance of education in the paranormal. Many people or groups, for that matter, think they know all there is to know about the paranormal and don't think that they need someone lecturing them. So why do you think so many groups out there have this attitude towards learning? Well, because they watch these t- the paranormal TV shows and they see plumbers and guys who have no educational background whatsoever <laughs> doing what they want to be doing and with their own TV series, and they assume that uh, because these guys have admitted that they don't have any sort of educational background, that they don't need any any either. Right. So it's well, unfortunate. It's really unfortunate. Um, you know, TV's kind of made um, has really kind of created a, a, an atmosphere of scientific ignorance. <laughs> what it comes to. <laughs> mm-hmm. 
Well, Professor, what do you actually teach in your classes? Well, the classes, depending on the class, of course, but I, I cover what the field of parapsychology has done in this area since, well, since the mid-1800s, since there before, before there actually even was a field of psychical research. Um, you know, people have been doing investigations even before the foundation, uh, the founding of the Society for Psychical Research in 1882, and there are an awful lot of people in the sciences who were involved in the early days and actually throughout the early 20th century especially from kind of the mainstream in some respects. Um, establishing methodologies, coming up with models of how this stuff works and what we, we may be dealing with, and also how to deal with it, how to, you know, resolve situations for people. My classes cover the science of parapsychology and what we've, what we've dealt with with ESP, with mind over matter, psychokinesis, and with the, uh, the concept of survival of bodily death, which is all three of these play into uh, the field investigation piece. And I cover both the laboratory research as well as the field work that's been done, as well as people's normal experience, you know, what kind of experiences people have had, what people have reported, the patterns we've dealt with, uh, we've, we've seen. And, of course, when I do my investigations class, I, among other things, I deal with the technology that is being adopted by uh, so many people that, and its severe limitations in doing what, they, what people think it's doing. Hmm. Well, you received a degree in parapsychology mm -hmm. at JFK University. And many people who are listening right now may not know exactly what parapsychology is. Can you briefly explain what it is and why it's an important field to learn? Well, parapsychology is the study of psychic phenomena, and that includes extrasensory perception, which is telepathy, clairvoyance, precognition. Uh, it includes psychokinesis, mind over matter, in many different forms. And it includes phenomena and experiences around life after death or survival of bodily death, which includes apparitions, you know, ghosts. It includes hauntings, potentially. It includes um, reincarnation, out-of-body experience, near-death experience, a variety of different experiences. It's the study of how human consciousness, both living and dead, because we're looking at the existence of human consciousness after your body has died, but how consciousness connects with the world around it directly, without the use of the normal senses, without the use of logical inference or normal, or normal means. So when the word paranormal, for example, was coined, it was coined in the 19th century by people in the field of psychical research, and it represented experiences on the side of normal, which is what parapsychology means on the side of psychology, uh, because we're dealing with experiences and ways of looking at the mind that are not accepted in the mainstream. Uh, kind of like not accepted as normal these days. But we, in the field of parapsychology, given how many people have had these experiences and the kinds of experiences people have had that have been noted since the very beginning of the field, and certainly well before that, we have seen that these are really ex normal experiences. They may be rare in some cases, but they are within the normal human experience that we're dealing with. We, you know, Professor, we just talked last week to uh, Ben Hansen of Sci-Fi Factor Fake, and the topic was about UFOs. And Lucy and I had mentioned that the government had funded SETI, the, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, from 1971 mm -hmm. to 1995, almost 25 years. In your opinion, why hasn't there been any funding from the government for parapsychological studies or paranormal scientific research in general, for that matter? Well, there, there has been. Uh, not a lot. Uh, right. And uh, that's kind of what our book ESP Wars is about, in fact, is that there was a project. It wasn't a lot of money. It was a little over $20 million for a 20-plus year program that was um, conducted within the Defense Department for the most part, and then the CIA took it over for the last couple of years. It um, was looking at practical applications of psychic functioning. You know, the government doesn't fund a lot of scientific research unless it is in its plan for uh, whether it's energy or defense. So unless you can show a real potential practical, um, or, or of course they do fund some biological work too, but that's a health issue, you know, in a different area. But it really it's been mainly the Defense Department that has funded things in the sciences, with some coming from uh, the Department of Energy certainly, and a few other departments. But it, it's not funding all sciences. Um, that's just not happening. And part of why the funding has not been coming from the government is because there's really not been um, anyone in the government or any organization in the government which has been terribly interested in consciousness issues at all. Mm. So, uh, you know, unless you can weaponize it or use it for espionage or spying, which is kind of what, 
what uh, the Stargate project did. Uh, right. It it doesn't show a lot of interest for a lot of people. Um, so, on top of that, you have funding sources that do fund the sciences, but most of them are kind of motivated by what kind of practical applications are there that we can do regularly and make some money at. There's very little funding for pure theoretical science, although that does happen from time to time. You don't get as much uh, of that typically as you do in the practical area in general. Do you, do you think we'd be in, 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 a, um, in a sort of different state right now, maybe even a, a more advanced level, if there was much more more funding, not so much government funding, but more broad and gov- uh, more broad and uh, funding for uh, psycho psycho um, uh, parapsychological studies or you know any kind of paranormal scientific research studies, do you think we'd be more advanced now if there was more funding, more involvement in that matter? Well, what, what you'd find with more funding is more more people in the field. It's, this is a very, very limited field. There are not a lot of people in the field because even my, I don't have any funding. So the work that I do is kind of, I have to find a lot of other things that I have to do to support my, you know, pay my mortgage and do everything else to support my time. Right. So um, there's not a lot of folks in the field in general, and those people who are in the field have been able to get funding for very specific types of research. And it doesn't always leave, leave a lot of room for speculation and for acting on the speculation in pure research. Uh, I think that, yes, if, if we had a lot more funding, there would be a lot more people involved in the field with a lot of potentially good ideas. And we'd be approaching the, the problems, the questions we have around this from a variety of different viewpoints and not just a, na- a few narrow bands for those of us that are already in it. Uh, we need to bring people in from other fields. I and mean, one of the things that would happen, if we had a lot of funding coming into the field uh, available, it would, first of all, fund everybody who's in the field. And if you could fund people outside the field, there are a lot of people in other sciences who would absolutely get in lo- involved, even though they deny they would. There are many people in other in mainstream sciences that if there was funding, they would actually come over to our side, if you might say. <laughs> Uh, you know, the problem is it's a little it's a little safer for them to say that this yeah. stuff doesn't exist academically and to keep the funding that that they have coming in right now. But if somebody dangled a carrot in front of them, they would jump for that. Right. Well, you know, I, I guess having you in, in in this world and being on the board of directors for all of these organizations, we actually should be lucky. And I encourage everyone who's listening right now um, to to you know. Go out there and, and fund uh, the organizations that uh, Professor Auerbach is is, is um, a part of. And, you know, one of the organizations that uh, you're on the board of is the Ryan Education Center. And I recently heard mm-hmm. about an amazing research program studying healers and the measurement of, I think it was photons. Can you tell us more Bio-photons. about this? Uh, yeah. Biophotons. Can you Bio-photons, talk about that? Uh, yeah. Can you talk about that yeah, research I mean, program? Sure, sure. It's one piece of research that has some funding coming towards it, um, to it, and uh, the Ryan Center is actually doing a number of different types of, uh, has a bunch of research projects on its list. Um, a few are funded and a few are waiting and waiting for a little bit, and the funding we're talking about is only in the, in the low thousands, by the way. Hmm. It's not big funding. Um, but the idea here is that, um, you know, in, in the literature, whether it's the historical literature, in the folklore, Healers are often depicted as giving off energy, and sometimes in, in artwork they're depicted as having halos and glows around them. And we do know that human beings give off photons. We don't give off a lot. Um, they're called biophotons. The body, the brain, gives off detectable photons. If the person is in an environment, you can put them in an environment which is completely blacked out, uh, and you use a photomultiplier that can pick up um, effectively one photon. So you have to really kind of set the bar low. Uh, very, very sensitive for this. And this yeah. is what they've done at the Ryan Center. There's a, an isolation room which um, we're putting, they're putting healers into. They ask them to kind of do their thing, basically put the energy out for healing, even though they're not directly healing anyone, but to, to kind of go through the meditation or go through the visualization, whatever else. And then they measure any sort of change in the biophoton emission from uh, before they did their thing to while they're doing their thing and then after they're doing their thing. And they have had an enormous, uh, in a couple of cases, um, individual healers have had an enormous <laughs> increase in the hundreds of thousands of biophotons, not just like one or two. Um, they're usually in the ultraviolet range, so they're not going to be visible. It's not like the person's lighting up the room. 
but um, and, and by the way, they're coming very fast. That's another thing that's there. But they're detectable, and mm. this is something that is um, being carried out further because if it turns out that the person who claims to be doing healing can generate something at will, um, then the question is what the biophotons may be an element of like a, I guess you could say like a tracer bullet. Okay. In, in the old movie. Okay. So it's kind of indicating that something's going on. So now right. how do we direct the, direct that energy. But then the other next step is to try to see, because it's not the biophotons themselves that are causing the healing, but what else may be going on. But we are saying for sure that there is a difference between the person who is a healer and the person who is, let's say, just a meditator or somebody else. It, it, it's almost reminding me of, of that uh, scientific research. I think it was called 21 grams, um, where, where some scientist was weighing, um, I, I, I'm assuming, a deceased body before and after or during the process of right. of dying. And uh, the, the weight of the body was supposed to be different, less or more, I'm not even sure. But it so, sounds almost similar to that kind of research. Well, funny you should mention that. Um, first, um, the, the, the research which was done, which was done uh, in the early 20th century mm. on that, the person weighed the body as the person died, and it was 21 grams less. There was okay. a replication done by some researchers with animals, because doing it with humans these days, it, it's pretty unethical. Right, that. right. So it was done with animals, and the thing is there was very mixed results with the animals. Some animals gained some grams, and some animals lost some grams. So something else was going on there. So what they've been working on, again, a little a small funded project to work with or try to work with people who go out of body or claim to go out of their body and to see whether there is a weight difference when they're out to when they're in. Um, it takes a while to call it. They've been taking forever to calibrate using the correct scale and everything because when people squirm around, you have to set it so that that doesn't set off the scale on itself in itself. Right. Right. Uh, you know, one of the issues that was was mentioned about the 21 grams question is that uh, how is that measured? Because the body often loses fluids when death happens. And, and, right, and gases, correct? And gases, correct. So there are some issues. So they're looking with the out of body stuff. Uh, part of the study will be to have the people, when they are ostensibly out of their body, being weighed, go into that isolation room, which is dark and see if they can read a target there, or if they can set off biophoton emission, if they can oh, really? set off the photomultiplier there. So kind of combining the, the uh, efforts as well. So there's, there's a little bit of uh, a bunch of things going on at the Ryan Center, some of which are, like, are funded. You know, one of the things you mentioned funding the Ryan Center, um, the Ryan Center is something people can join. You can join as a member, and people hmm. are blithely unaware of how much material you get if you become a member. They have uh, lectures in Durham, North Carolina, every other week. They've been having uh, lectures for several years and then special programs, and they've been video recording those. And there's a media library of all these lectures. You become a member, you have access to many, many, many hours of all these lectures and programs that um, are part of the media library for members. In fact, if you go to the Ryan Center, Center you can see there's, there's a few things there for free in the media library. And it's just Ryan, R H I N E dot org. But that's uh, joining. Joining is good. First of all, it's tax deductible. It's at the 501c3 uh, nonprofit, okay. and you can you can also join as a sustainer. Um, you know, set it up so that PayPal you send via PayPal ten dollars a month, uh, and sustaining members after a certain amount of time get to, you get all the benefits of being a member. Uh, so uh, that's if you're going at the low end. If you're going to the higher end, you absolutely become a member right away. All right. <laughs> and well, that's great. I mean. It, 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 you know, you, I, I mean, obviously you, you, you're um, connected to a lot of organizations. And the, and the other one is Forever Family Foundation, which I found to be the most uplifting and comforting group out there for families that have sort of lost loved ones and the support for their bereavement and, and understanding of the afterlife. And I really have to commend you for being a part of this group and, and promoting its mission statement in the programs. Why is, is this organization so important for people who are in the paranormal field, as you were just talking before about the Ryan Institute, uh, the Ryan Center? Why is it that also the, you know, the Forever Family Foundation, why is it important for folks in the paranormal field to be part of it, or why should they be a member of it as well? Well, the, the Forever Family Foundation is a little different organization. It supports research into survival or life after death. So it support, helps support and promote research around apparitions and hauntings. So we're talking about ghost stuff. That's important. Mm -hmm. It uh, supports research with spirit mediums uh, and looking at communication issues. It supports research with 
uh, people attempting instrumental transcommunication, of which EVP is part, and supports research in reincarnation, near-death experience, all those things. And so it's partly an educational organization. It is also an organization that supports people who have experiences. Um, and that's really its key function. It was started by a couple who had lost their, their daughter in a car crash. And immediate, through a, a series of unusual circumstances, they heard from their daughter after her death through a medium through a friend of theirs. Uh, and mm. Bob Ginsberg, who was an absolute skeptic at the time, was convinced after meeting with the medium and the kind of information that came through that um, she was in communication with, with their daughter. And more importantly, the two of them got an enormous lifting of their grief in the process. Mm. It was a very um, enlightening and helped their grieving process and was healthy for them. And they decided to start this organization to help other people who have lost family members work with mediums for the specific intention of alleviating grief. They work with grief counselors as well, um, so it's not just the psychic side. They're working, you know, they insist, in fact, on having kind of the combination of the psychological and the psychic. Uh, but as it happens, there's the problem in the grief counseling area is that's a really, really tiny area in psychology. Uh, there's not a lot of people trained well at that. So yeah. they're really trying to help foster some training in that area as well, uh, you know, grief retreats and things like that. So do, they also... Do they have... Um, yeah, go ahead. Do do they have camps around around the country, or are they centrally located and and maybe sort of send folks well, out from there? It, it there are um, people they refer to in different parts of the country. They don't really have setups right now. We're we're actually going to be in the process after this. Uh, we have an upcoming conference in November, which will be in Durham. It's been moving around the country. This will be the last big conference on uh, life after death that we're doing. And the plan is to do smaller events around the U.S. and do supporting. Um, they're doing a grief retreat actually in Connecticut in July. It's kind of a. Uh, they've done a couple of these before, but the idea is to, to, to template that in different parts of the country. Um, so that's going to be something we're going to be setting up. And then there are some other circumstances, other types of events we want to set up for people who believe they are in, spirit, in communication with spirits. Um, at whatever level they happen to be, uh, or having experiences with us. So we're going to be supporting more experiential stuff coming going forward also after this big event. In the meantime, um, we're trying to set up discussion groups, and there are discussion groups the Forever Family Foundation has supported, and the same thing with the Bryan Center. They seem to be mainly on the East Coast. Uh, that's where the Forever Family is centered as well. They're headquartered in, on Long Island. Uh, I'm, I'm in the West Coast um, trying to get people to, to start doing these same kinds of groups out here. We're trying to get them get that going as well, and all, in different parts of the country as well. Sounds great. And by the way, the, it, it's free to join the Forever Family Foundation. So that's one that people can join for free. And they get um, a newsletter and some other material, and uh, they do a weekly radio show, and that's up on their website as well. Great. You know what, Professor... Anthony and I have talked to many people and groups who either strictly only conduct residential paranormal investigations mm -hmm. or do some of them from time to time. Now, Anthony and I refuse to do re residential investigations because we freely admit to not knowing everything about the paranormal and still need to learn more before even thinking about doing that. What are some of the misconceptions that people have about investigating homes, and how to deal with the families involved. Well, you need to have some people skills because you are <laughs> dealing with people. <laughs> right. and, 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 and you can't follow the methods you see on, mo on the TV shows. I mean, uh, I get calls from people who had had the local ghost hunting group out. The group came in. For the most part, the group kicks, kicks these people out of their homes because, you know, the TV shows tell them that um, witness testimony is anecdotal, so you don't even need the witnesses there. They do their tech thing, and the next morning they give them a report and say, oh, yeah, you got a ghost, um, or, you, or you got an evil ghost. <laughs> right. And, then they, and they leave them high and dry. So there's no follow-through. There's nothing helping them. It, it, it's, and in most of the time, frankly, they're wrong in on, on terms of what they've uncovered because they've gone based on their technology, which none of which is designed to detect or can detect the paranormal. And by leaving out the witness testimony, and the, the very idea of ignoring, and I'm, I hear this from people that, because these shows say it's anecdotal. Well, you know what? 
um, all of social science is based on subjective experience, every bit of it. We can't psychology. You can't measure anything. You can measure the brain, but that doesn't tell you anything. You have to relate it to people's experience. That's anecdotal experience. All of it. The legal system, until very recently, was totally based on anecdotal experience, witness testimony. Mm. So right. you know, you can't throw that out, especially since if you're going to a home. The question I would have to somebody who says we don't need, we don't use anecdotal evidence. My question then is, what are you investigating? Because the very report that they have something in their home falls under that same rubric. So if you don't include any of the witness testimony, then you have nothing to investigate at all. Mm. So one of the things I do teach in my courses is interviewing skills, you know, how, how you have to interview people. There are listening skills involved. You know, there's a lot of people skills and client-related skills that you've got to learn to deal with, and that's part of the science, and that's, that's technically part of the methodology. And you also have to understand that when you do homes, the, the supposed science often goes out the window. Uh, you can't apply the scientific method in a lot of these circumstances simply because it's more important ethically and otherwise to help the family members the people who have called you in, than it is to gather data that you can use. It's much more important to do that. So people, these, these TV shows do not teach that. They don't show that, and uh, unfortunately, I think that you've chosen not to do that, the home thing. I think that's smart until you're at a point where you know enough to do it. I think that's a really smart place. I wish more people would do that, would be in that spot, that mind space. Well, you know, if there's any listeners out there who are, are, are listening right now that may be thinking of doing something like this and, and, and taking on a case where, where they would go to a residential home, what would you want them to sort of think about before they enact on, on such an adventure or, or such a journey? Well, I, I think they need to think about what they're going to be doing for the people. I mean, what are they doing actually for the people whose home they're going into? Uh, what can they do, and what what will the, the outcome be if they do encounter something psychic or paranormal, and what would the outcome be if they don't, if they come up with another explanation, because that's part of the process is to take everybody's, all the reports, and try to find an explanation for each and every one of them, not just the overall case. So are they going to, the, the big question is, is to ask them is, are they going to be better off than before you came in, and how are they going to be better off? than before you came in. Do you, do you think also, too, that they should also um, acknowledge where they're lacking, what, what skills or abilities they're lacking, and understand and, and own up to it, um, and maybe even communicate that so the expectations, if they are going to go into this, at least the other parties understand and know what they can and cannot do as well? Oh, absolutely. Um, I have sent out – I've gotten calls from around the country, and sometimes there are places where i just got nobody I can refer them to. And I, I happen to have a friend or two, somebody I knew really well, who was somewhat interested in the subject but not, not really trained in it. And I've sent them in as kind of interviewers to, find, to, to get more information than I could get on the phone. Mm. Uh, I kind of talk them through that. And the first thing they're supposed to do, and they always do this, is say, I'm one of Lloyd's friends. I'm not a parapsychologist. I'm not an investigator. I'm here to, to represent him and get some more information so he can help you out more, a little bit more down the road, hmm. since we have nobody local for that. And that's okay, too, um, because that, again, like you said, it sets, sets expectations. Um, one of the things that is on my website and everything, I train all my students, we can't, we've had success in our field in resolving situations. In other words, helping phenomena stop or change or educate people so they're comfortable with it. We've had a success. We can't guarantee it. You just can't guarantee it. And, right. you know, the biggest problem here, frankly, one of the questions I ask in my pre-interviews on the phone is um, how people feel about normal explanations. Because what i found is a lot of people are very invested personally in the explanation being paranormal. Right. And then when we go in and find out that it's not, are they going to accept that even – when, and they have to be shown, you know, it has to be fully explained. So I, I'm not expecting them to, to take my word for it. So it has to be explained to them in a way that they can see that that's actually going on. But I've had cases where that's not been the case. Uh, people have just absolutely refused 
to see what's in front of their faces, and they still yeah. say it's paranormal and often evil, and they just want to be scared. They, yeah. they have uh, an investment in that, and if I hear that on the phone, I'm not even. It, it, there's a case where it doesn't make sense for me to go because if we do find that there's nothing going on, which I would never even say to them unless I really have a good feeling that that's what's go, what's happening, um, I'm not going to be doing them any good by being there. Right. And mm-hmm. I've actually had a couple of instances where that was the case. I went into the case, did find that it was nothing paranormal, and the next thing I know, um, I've heard uh, that people, are, these people, the clients are telling everyone that they had something evil in their house and that Lloyd Auerbach said it was a demon, both of which were not only not true, but I would never say it was a demon under any circumstance. And, uh, you know, I've had to kind of clean up messes with the media and other people. Fortunately, a lot of media people know that I wouldn't say stuff like that. Mm. But it's, uh, it happens. It certainly happens. And, and that's when psychology kicks in, you know? Yeah. That, that, that's yeah. when the psychology of it all kicks in, because you have to figure out why are they so fixated on wanting this to be a paranormal explanation. Well, you know, for some people it's because it makes them feel special. And the other is because, I mean, frankly... Uh, when people find out that it is something they misunderstood or didn't gauge right in the environment, something natural, um, they're embarrassed, a lot of people. And, I, and part of my job is to convince them that there's no reason to be embarrassed because it's not like they were educated in a way that would have had them even guess that that was a possible explanation. I had a case here in the Bay Area years ago where the description of what was going on was it was four family members all um, – they had, a, they had moved into this house. They were leasing a house that was relatively new. Um, there was a, a room in the house that everyone felt dizzy and would get headaches. They were seeing shadows out of the corners of their eyes. There were noxious odors that were floating through the house. And they would see balls of fire burst into being in midair and sometimes on the walls and would singe things. Um, they, they, there were a number of other elements going on as well. And when we got out there, First of all, we were referred to, um, they referred to me by the local police department after having been told by psychology department after psychology department here in the Bay Area from major schools that they must be crazy and they should come in for, um, for checkup uh, and testing. All four people. Um, the cops didn't want to deal with it, so they referred them to me. We went over there and we found explanations for every bit of it. First of all, the house was directly under high-tension power lines, which meant that, by the way, if anybody had an EMF meter, it was useless. Um, the house had been built by, um, with experimental materials, unusual materials designed by an architecture professor at UC Berkeley. And the, set, the house materials themselves were generating, because of the high-tension wires, were generating a lot of static electricity. Um, part of the house was not on the foundation properly, so part of the room, this one room where they felt dizzy, was slightly... Um, not level, and the doors and windows were not 90 degrees, but it was enough of an optical difference that you couldn't really tell the difference, but you're, you could tell, uh, which is how they got dizzy and headaches, and then there was low-frequency hum from the wires that was causing them to see things out of the corner of their eyes. There was methane gas seeping up from the ground because they were on the other hill, side of the hill from the local landfill. The static electricity was catching the noxious, odor, noxious gas on, on fire. You know, these were environmental conditions, but not environmental conditions that 99.99999% of the population would know anything about. Hmm. So they were not stupid under any circumstance. They made a mistake in considering the paranormal as the explanation. But right. that was a miscategorization because they didn't have the understanding environmentally and otherwise. You know, they didn't know the zoning laws and all that other stuff either. They didn't have that understanding. So. Uh, and I can only assume that uh, there's a lot of people in the ghost hunting world who also don't, I know that they don't have that understanding either. So they would have missed on that too. Well, you know, kind of along those lines, we've also talked about the idea of creating some sort of regulation in the paranormal field. I mean, we know that the paranormal is real and that spirits and ghosts do exist, which also invites m- the many other things that cr- that can come through that can be dangerous or that can be harmful if you're not conducting yourself properly or having the wrong mindset when at a haunted location. Do you agree with the idea that there should be some sort of blanket set of do's and don'ts that groups should abide by and work by, and if they don't, 
lose their validity and their credentials for continuing? Well, first of all, who's going to credential them to begin with? That's the right. question, because without education, there's no credentialing. And groups have been self-certifying, and people who don't know any better have been offering certifications and all sorts of stuff um, for years with, with no educational background themselves. So before you can have any sort of rules or regulations, of, you have to have education for that. Uh, and uh, unless groups, individuals and groups decide, you know, there's a lot of material on the Internet that's terrible, but there's actually a lot of stuff that's good. And there's a lot of free stuff on the Internet that's good. There, the early books from the Society for Psychical Research and other researchers, the early ghost hunters, that stuff's all free. It's all there um, on Google Books and archive.org. So people could read some of the early methods, which we carry over to today without the technology, of course, because we, we have new technology. But they could learn from the past, which is how you learn in any field. You don't learn from TV. You learn from the past for people who have done this work, and you build on that work. You don't simply simply make it up out of whole cloth, which is what has been happening. So you can't really have – I mean, I've got do's and don'ts, but – they don't mean anything to anybody unless they know what, what some of the do's are and what some of the don'ts mean. Uh, and the biggest issue here is without education and curiosity. Uh, I have to be honest that the biggest, I guess you could say, bugaboo I have, the, the thing that boggles my mind is how so many people I've met have no curiosity about the phenomena, about what they're doing, about the questions behind the phenomena, about the history of the field, uh, they have no question, they have no curiosity. And I, I don't understand how that's possible, except that, let's face it, a large percentage of the people who are in this are in it because they're thrill seekers, not because they actually have any interest in, in learning anything or understanding right. the phenomena. Just, go, just going out and ha having a good time, that's basically it. That's pretty much it, yeah. They, all, they want their team, they all have to have their roles in the team, you know, um, they, ha they have to have their labels, they have to have their positions, and that is the only thing that's important to them. Uh, I mean, I, I see uh, rules. There are rules and regulations that a lot of uh, these ghost hunting groups have on, on their, their websites. You look at them, and it's things like don't smoke, don't drink. Um, right. You know, it's, it's things that, first of all, make, per make sense, of course, but it's common sense stuff It has no and has nothing to do with the phenomena at all. Right, or people's right. Experience. You know, there, there's many reality and non-reality based paranormal shows on television now that actually leave me biting my tongue at times. And I, I understand that air, airing what a true life paranormal investigation looks like on TV would probably be considered boring and not exciting to most people. But what I don't understand is why we need to create this tough guy attitude or, or give that sex appeal in these programs. To me, it's almost demoralizing in a way. What do you think the paranormal shows are missing? Well, they're missing the witness, the, the ghost story. They're missing the actual experiences people have. Mm. And they're, they're missing the thing that needs to be investigated. And the, even, the, even the shows where they're ostensibly doing that, like Paranormal State supposedly did that, but Paranormal State was heavily edited for a very specific um, perspective, a demonic right. perspective, to scare people. And there, there were a number of people who came out of the woodwork who were, cl who were featured on the show or clients on the show who talked about how their story was completely twisted. So we're missing truth. We're missing the human element, which is the most important element, whether they're living humans or dead humans, it's the most important element. And it's always in favor of the, you know, the characters. You know, these shows are not about investigations. They're about the teams. They're about the people on those teams. They're basically running soap operas about putting these people in different situations kind of like Survivor. <laughs> That's exactly it. <laughs> and, you know, you, 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 having worked, you hit the having nail right with on Mark, the head right there. <laughs> yeah, and having worked with Mark Burnett, here's an interesting thing. He told mm. me that um, they have, like, you know, for the 16 people that first get on the, in the area and the island or wherever they're going, they have a camera crew on every individual person. So they, imagine that, 16 camera crews. Whew. And they turn in a they were turning in a rough they would turn in a rough cut of the show. Here's the hour they turn it into the network, and if the network executives would look at it or somebody would look at it and say, you know, I want more of Fred over here. I don't want as much of Bill or Susan. Fred's more interesting. So they, he has 300 hours of video that gets cut down to less than 42 minutes, based on what they think is the most interesting parts of this. 
Right. So you never, never see. On top of that, you know, any reality show where people are going out into the field, people, it's, it's just amazing to me. You know, you see these shows where the guy, the guy, like there was a show called Cities of the Underground, uh, where this guy it was a great show. We're talking about the underworld or underground beneath several world cities that sometimes went down multiple levels, and the hmm. city built upon city. And you'd see the guy coming into a chamber. And you could see his face coming into the chamber. He said, I'm the very first person coming into this chamber right now. Yeah, so who the, who's got the camera? <laughs> <laughs> but, you, but, you know, but, you know, Professor, what I find interesting, though, um, you know, and I know Lucy and I are interested in this manner as well, and I notice a lot of other people are, but, like, you know, the show's Big Brother, and I hate to sort of get off a little topic, uh, off the topic mm-hmm. a little bit, but, uh, you know, the show Big Brother, um, but also, too, there are paranormal groups out there that, that perform uh, live investigations online, and they'll have it for right. 8 to 10 hours or all night long, and it's online, and I will be glued, and I know Lucy will be as well, we'll be glued to that laptop or that computer, and we'll watch it for hours, and it's just interesting, and I know Big Brother had, had done that. I don't know if they still do that, but they had that online option where you can mm-hmm. go and just be almost like a voyeur and watch what's going on. I think that's interesting. I don't know if it's just myself, my you know my passion in this field, that I love to do that. I love to watch those paranormal investigations and, and all that boring aspect that people think are boring. I love it because it's it's including me in, in that factor, and that's why... I, I, I'm a little bit, you know, biting my tongue with a lot of these paranormal shows because they're not really showing the true aspect of, of what it is in the field. No, they're not. They're, well, you know, any TV show, it, unless it's a sports event, you, you really can't show the whole thing. Mm. Uh, you do least there's a large percentage of the population who is going to get bored. Frankly, you know, I sit there and, and wait for stuff to happen. I get bored. And I don't do overnight investigations unless they're warranted. You know, the whole overnight thing was something that was created by the TV shows. Um, right. We go as much as possible. We go into the location, family location, other locations during the times when pe- when people have reported phenomena. So if the activity is mostly at eleven o'clock in the morning, that's when we want to be there. We can't always be there because the family may not be home all the time, or we can't get out of people can't get out of jobs. But we try to be there at that time. We uh, public places that I've investigated. Some of the restaurants we sometimes been there after hours, and sometimes for hours on end waiting for something to happen, and to, make, to bring something happening, part of it is to do communication. That's why we, I work with psychics and mediums as much as I can. I, work, I bring in the witnesses. If, they could, if people who have been in the situation had experiences, having them around, they're already connected theoretically to the ghost or the haunting, so let's see if they have another experience. You mm. bring in the human element to kind of help that. And we don't sit around in the dark because it's very, very rare for anyone other than ghost hunters, to report anything happening when the lights are all out. Now, stuff happens mm. at night, it happens during the daytime. The dark thing would never have happened if night shot cameras hadn't been in existence. It <laughs> never would have happened. I was doing TV, uh, have been doing TV since the early 80s, and I did a show called Sightings. You might remember that. Um, yes. That was on, and, you know... The directors would always ask, and this is at the very beginning of when night shot cameras were first coming out, and they constantly say, you know, can we turn all the lights out? And the camera guy, you know, because at that time for network TV, you would never use scratchy video from a home video camera because it wasn't good enough quality. So night shot was not even usable because it was so bad in terms of right. the quality of video. The quality, right. In the meantime, the camera guy saying, can't turn the lights out. We can't see anything. You can't put dark on TV. It's boring, you know, and you can't have a bunch of voices in the dark. It's just people are going to change the channel. They're going to think something's wrong with their TV. So once night shot cameras got to be good enough quality, then you could have the spookiness of the thing. But even so, even without night shot, a lot of times they wanted to have the lights down low and they wanted to have atmosphere. Uh, I did one segment for Evening Magazine in the 80s, and they actually put a fog machine in this toy store we were investigating to try to set the atmosphere. For, for us walking around. <laughs> like, so, like you, you know, need to create an atmosphere. Right, right. So it's, it's about setting atmosphere. It's about uh, a point of view. It's, you know, technically these shows should be entertainment, and they are entertaining for a lot of people. It's yeah. unfortunate that too many people take them absolutely seriously and as the absolute truth. That's right. where we run into a problem. You know, it'd be, it'd be like, you know, somebody deciding they're going to become a cop uh, and put on uh, and grab a gun and go out and start going after criminals by watching the TV show Cops. Hmm. 
Well, you know, we're going to talk about um, uh, more about this, my next particular question, after our interview uh, later on in the show. But I wanted to get your opinion on haunted location owners and, and greed. In, in, in general, what are your thoughts on locations that open up their places to groups for, for money? Well, I think it partly depends on the location, of course. Um, having talked to many people about whether they should charge money for their, for their location, whether they should even let groups come in, uh, it, it partly depends on, uh, for a lot of them on whether they're going to lose business otherwise. Um, I know I work with several, I've worked with several haunted restaurants. They do not allow overnight investigations because they have a three-hour window between the time they close and when the maintenance guys come in to clean up the restaurant for their breakfast service. And right. they would lose way too much money. They charge TV companies to come in and spend, spend the night because they have to shut the restaurant down for a day. So there is that kind of uh, – it's not even greed because they're usually only going to charge typically, if they can get it, what they would lose in business mm. for, mm -hmm. for a good day. So there's that element. Um, there are places that were struggling financially. Uh, and suddenly they find that there is a uh, – there's somebody who's willing to pay them to keep open. Uh, where, you know, maybe a historical location that needs some support. Uh, I think that that's a mixed bag because I know of places that, that basically um, exaggerate what's been going on in the past. They even make stuff up right. to, to, uh, to really kind of push the fee up higher. That's, uh, that's inappropriate. It's on, I think it's highly unethical. But that wouldn't happen if the groups weren't willing to pay. That's the problem, is the groups are willing to pay for it. And uh, it's kind of a symbiotic, parasitical relationship <laughs> in, in so many ways. Um, I know of pl places that are charging so much money, I can't believe that they're actually getting it. And I'm just shocked that people are willing to pay but they're not willing to, you know, to support the research organizations or even connect with the research organizations, which right. drives me nuts right. that uh, they'll spend $300 to do an overnight someplace. Um, I know the, I work with the USS Hornet Aircraft Carrier Museum, and they do charge uh, about 100 bucks a person to stay overnight. And they kind of have to because they have to pay staff to be there, and they have to pay for the lights to be on, um, they, and they have to pay, and there's also insurance and other issues that pop up as well. So, right. it's, and they limit the number of people. It's not like they're bringing 300 people on. They're, you know, going to keep it limited to a very, very small group, and it barely. And, and they also are a museum and a nonprofit. So I can't call hmm. them greedy. I can. Th I think that that's entirely appropriate. And then when re when actual researchers want to go on board and do that sort of thing, they look for volunteers to stay overnight with them. I know that because I've done that. With right. Them. And they're very willing to do legitimate stuff, but they're not willing to um, offer free run. Uh, to anybody who wants to come on the ship and do an overnight. And the same with a lot of these other places. So um, I, I think it's just you have to look at it a case-by-case -case basis. Some of them are really gouging people. But, again, I think people are, if they're willing to pay for it, it it's a problem on both sides. Well, in your words, Professor, what is the paranormal field missing right now? I think it's missing a field. I don't think it is a field. <laughs> Um, there's, there's not actual research being done except by very few people out there in, in, in that. Um, it's amazing. Again, it's missing this connection to the actual field. There's a field of science that's been around since the mid-1800s, late-1800s, that studies paranormal phenomena called psychical research parapsychology. For people to say that there's a paranormal field, which would imply that there are people doing actual research, um, is and our actual scientific research, there are a few people who are trying things, but, there are, but the majority of folks are not doing it in any way, shape, or form that resembles science. And it's really more of a paranormal community, which has its own, um, it's like a paranormal family seeing all the fights that go on. <laughs> it's, a it's a dysfunctional family, actually. Is what it is. So I think what it, what it needs, what people need to do is set aside their egos and learn something. And, you know, the, the thing about this is that the people who actually learn something who are out there, I, I know several people who actually know stuff who are in these, some of these groups out there. They end up a lot of times getting frustrated because the rest of the people who have come into their group or um, taken over their group in some instances, they want to follow the TV shows because it's, it's cooler to be in the dark than it is to, to follow any sort of methods. 
So I think what people need to do is step away from their uh, ignorance or their lack of curiosity. I think people need to, what they really need to do is people need to be honest. It's perfectly mm. okay if people want to run around in the dark, do, try to get EVPs, run around with their instruments. That's okay. But don't call yourself a scientist. Don't call yourself, say that you're doing scientific research because you're not. Don't say that you are um, a serious investigator because you're not. Be honest. Um, hobbyists are not a problem. Amateurs, there's very few actual amateurs out there. Um, and here I'm using the word amateur like an amateur astronomer. Amateur astronomers and amateur geologists actually know something about their fields. They may not have the academic credentials. They may not have gone through academic courses. But they have spent the time to get educated. And a lot of discoveries are actually made by amateurs in a number of fields who have either self-educated or educated themselves by speaking to and connecting to researchers in the field. There's a lot of well-respected amateurs in physics and other areas, but that's not happening, certainly, in, uh, with very rare exception in the so-called paranormal field. Well said. So we have, very well said. I'll, I'll, mention, I'll mention that the um, annual meeting of the Parapsychological Association, which is the, the scientific organization, of parapsychologists and psychical researchers in the world um, is having its annual convention out here in Northern California. I'm actually hosting it, uh, one of the hosts of, this, of the event, in August, mid-August. And we probably will have a couple people uh, who have an interest uh, or are interested enough to see what parapsychologists do and what the field work is and, and what we've been doing. It'll probably be boring for a lot of people because the TV shows never make a connection between research and ESP in the laboratory and field investigation of ghosts and hauntings and poltergeists, and there's a direct relationship here, hmm. especially in poltergeist phenomena and research and psychokinesis in the laboratory, direct relationship. So um, it, there's, there's a lot that can be offered in those kinds of circumstances. And, you know, this is the, the Parapsychological Association is the association connected to the American Association for the Advancement of Sciences, which is the official body of science in the United States, and it's the one that recognizes fields, and parapsychology is recognized by them. Um, the Society for Psychical Research over in Great Britain, which just got a, a wonderfully big um, bequest, an inheritance from somebody who passed away, to be used for education and public outreach, and I'm hoping they reach across the pond and, and bring some of, some of their work here to the United States. But they're a very serious organization. It's been doing great work, published a journal, and that's another one to join that has a phenomenal um, online library once you become a member. Uh, you know, supporting or connecting to these organizations makes you very well aware. And I, and I will say that this, the SPR does a lot of field work and investigation, has written a number of really important articles and papers in their journal about things like low-frequency sound and electromagnetic fields and stuff in, in the in-field investigation. So for people to be ignorant of that is, is really a shame. Uh, so the people who are curious should admit that they are and start using their curiosity, and everybody else should admit they're just having fun. And that's okay. Right. You know, uh, Professor, we, uh, just to get a little bit on the lighter side, um, we, we usually play a game with some of our, our guests, and we haven't done this in, in a while, um, so I mm -hmm. hope you're, you're up for it and, and willing sure. to participate. Um, you've heard of, I'm sure you've heard of James Lipton and the show Inside the Actors Studio? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so on his show, James usually um, has this segment where he'll read off a term or a word, and he'll ask his guest to sort of, what's the first thing that pops into your mind or, or into to your forefront of your mind as to a relation to that word? Are, are you okay. up or down for it? Just for sure, I'll, I'll, I'll go for it. I'll go for it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here goes. So I'll, I'll say a term, and you just say the first thing that pops into your head. Okay. <laughs> Ghost. <laughs> there are so many things that are popping through my head. The first, the first word that popped into my head uh, was actually a visual. It's the topper. Okay. The topper was an old. The topper was an old TV show and movie. That was the first thing uh -huh. I started watching about ghosts. So. Okay. Valid. Okay. Medium. Um, well, several, actually, the name of a medium just popped in my head, Sandra O'Hara, who is somebody I've just been, been working with. Paranormal shows. Um, a single word. Arg. 
<laughs> okay. Education. Important. Psychics. Um. <laughs> I usually work, see when I get these things like things visually pop in my head. So uh, my co-author of my last book, Annette Martin, just popped into my head. She was an, a wonderful psychic I work with. So that's okay. the name, the words that popped in. Paranormal groups, Ghostbusters, science. <laughs> well, right now the, the word that popped in my head was Cosmos TV show. Mm. Love that show. Mm. Afterlife. Research. Mentalist. Psychic entertainer. James Randi. Uh. <laughs> 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 or to quote Jimmy Fallon. I could quote Jimmy Fallon and say, Ew. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, and, and the last word is parapsychology. Home for me. Home. I like that. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> well, you know what, Professor? It has been so much fun and educational to have you on the show. And Thank you. I do have one last question to ask sure. you. What would be the one thing that you hope our listeners take away from tonight's discussion? I hope that uh, listeners would explore. Um, some of the sites, a couple of specifically, the Rhine Research Center site, Rhine, org, as a starting point for finding out about what parapsychology offers. Um, I hope that, that people really look inside themselves and see if they're curious about life after death, if they're curious about what these experiences actually mean, because they mean much to us as human beings, and to act on that curiosity and learn um, explore. I mean, there's tons of ghost stories out there too, by the way. So you can have fun when you're doing this, hmm. and um, and that's really important. You know, when I mentioned those books, the early books, some of them are incredibly fun in terms of some of the story that the people have reported and some of the things that were investigated. So uh, go for that, and I hope that people also will um, take time to look at possible uh, venues for education for learning whether it's to further themselves if they're going to be investigators or just for, for personal interest about their own experiences. Uh, and I'll mention my own website, which is mindreader.com, where you can start with a lot of articles that are there, too. Well, Professor, thank you again. And uh, you mentioned your website. and uh, mm -hmm. is, Are there any other places that uh, people can go to learn about you and the wonderful organizations that you're part of? Well, my website has links on the – when you first get in, it's kind of my, my most recent blogs or, or, or events that are up there when you first get there. And on the right-hand side, if you scroll down, you'll see a list of organizations and other websites to explore that are within and, and right on the outskirts of our field. Uh, so please, please, please take a look at those other organizations. There are many fine organizations to support or get involved with in many different ways. Some need volunteers. Uh, some need money, some need other kinds of support, and sometimes support is just simply spreading the word about the organization. It doesn't have to be monetary support either. Uh, that helps quite a bit, just letting people know that these organizations are out there. But my website has got all the organizations they can link to, including the Parapsychological Association, the Forever Family Foundation, the Ryan Center, and so many others that are really good places. Wonderful. Professor Arbach, thank you so much for coming on tonight, and we would love to have you on again in the future. Certainly, certainly. Great. Thank you so much, Lloyd. Have a great weekend. And again, for everyone who's listening, go to mindreader.com. You can check out everything that uh, Professor is doing and all the organizations that he is a part of. I encourage everyone to, to check out the Ryan Center, to check out Forever Family, um, and check out all the other organizations that he has there to offer because they've got great insight. And, and, and again, it all comes down to, I think, is the education that we all need and, uh, and is basically the purpose of our radio radio show tonight. So check it out, mindreader.com. Thank you. Thank you, Professor, so much for coming on the show. Thank you. Have a great Thank day. Thank you. Good night. Bye-bye. night. 
You know, it, it's sort of an under, underlining theme tonight, um, which is education. And, you know, you and I have, Lucy, you and I have always said this, that education is key, research. We labeled it as research, but it's all the same thing. Education is the main purpose or, or the main thing that everyone should really focus on. And I know that there are a lot of groups out there that do do that. And um, there are, are a lot of other folks who, who we know or are friends with who do the same. And and we like to encourage that. And that's one of the reasons why we brought uh, Professor Abrock on the show tonight was to talk about what what the what the field is missing, what, what groups and teams are missing out there. And I don't want people to get the wrong impressions from folks who may think they know it all um, and and sort of give that, I guess, smelly fish perception to certain folks out there that, uh, uh, you know, give us all a bad name. And, and, and the, the, the reason that, w that we wanted to talk to Professor uh, Auerbach is to get that communication out there, to, to instill it in folks that just admit or just acknowledge to yourself, you don't even have to do it publicly, just acknowledge your, to yourself that you, don't, you may not know it all. And it is good to get involved in in seminars and in conferences and conventions that are out there that speak to to educating folks within certain topics or certain areas within the paranormal. Education is the key because if you don't know what you're doing or you don't know what you're dealing with, then I'm I'm not sure and I'm not sure I understand you know why you're doing it to begin with, but two, why would you put yourself in a situation where you, you're not fully understanding what the outcome may be, or to even express it to someone who may not understand it as much as you do. And so it, it is key, and, it, and, and it's, it's almost sad, Lucy, that because uh, I had heard Professor Auerbach talking about this um, on another radio show, that uh, there's not a lot of students that are signing up for the classes that are, are being done. And, um, you know, it's not so much that you even have to go to class. These, these things are done online. Some of them are just pre-recorded, so you can play it and understand and, and, and educate yourself whenever you want. You want to do it 3.30 in the morning? Perfect. You're coming back from an investigation? Perfect. You know, it, it's just so great to, to fill your brain with that knowledge and to get that understanding because what happens at the end is, you only get better. You only look good in everybody else's eyes. Well, you know, one of the things that I'm really glad that he brought up was the fact that we don't all know. We don't all know everything, you know. I think there's just too many people out there who really do take what they see on television and they take it as gospel and you know, because you see people running around and, and, you know, reacting and doing all this, it is entertainment. It is a television show. It is probably nine to ten hours condensed into 40 minutes. So you're not going to get the whole basis of what everything is. And I think too many people see it and there's like, oh, you know, I can do that and that's what I want to do when basically they're setting themselves up for possible harm, for, you know, a possibly bad experience, I think it's really important, the education side of it. Investigating is more than just grabbing, you know, a camera and a digital recorder and just heading out. I mean, there has to be the reasoning why you're going there the reasoning why something could be happening, and if you don't do the research, I, I, I don't, I don't understand that. I, I really don't. And, and you know, Professor had said also too that you know it's it's perfectly fine for people who want to do this as a a fun night out or or something where you gather with friends and do periodically throughout the year. And um, he said it's perfectly fine to do that. You know, admit to, to that's what you're doing, and you're not really doing scientific research. You're not doing paranormal or, or um, paracyclical research and studies. It, it, that is not what you're doing, really. Um, so don't portray yourself as doing that. Just admit you're going out to have fun. You're going out for a high. Um, but with that also, too, 
you need to have that education because this isn't just an amusement park where you're going on a ride. I mean, when you go to, you know, Great Adventure or Disneyland or whatever, and, and you go on a roller coaster, you know what the consequences would, can be if something happens to that ride. You know fully well what can happen, but you're taking that chance. It's the same thing as if you're going into the paranormal. You have to understand what the consequences are. You have to understand what could go wrong. Even though you are there to have a good time and just a, an outing with friends or, or whatever it is, first of all, I don't think that should be done residentially. I don't think that should be done in, in, in a residential home. Um, you know, but if, if you're going to a location that could possibly be haunted, educate yourself and understand what it is. If not learning the whole gamut of paranormal, at least research and understand what the witnesses are talking about at this particular location, what are some of the sightings and evidence and experiences that people are having, so that you can research then before you go there on what the expectations are of yourself and of the place that you are going to. What are those expectations there? What can happen? Where's your limit? Where's that line that you don't cross? that you won't cross. And if obviously something doesn't feel good, isn't good, so you, you, you know, you, you have to get out. You have to leave. You, you don't just stay in it just to say that you stayed in it, you know. It, it isn't a game. It is an amusement park, and it's not Disneyland. It, it is real. And, and uh, you know, just admit to to the, the lack of knowledge that you have or the lack of um, passion that you have for something, uh, which is perfectly fine, but at least if you're going to do it, try to educate yourself a little bit. Well, I liked what he said about ego. You have to leave your ego at the door. It's not about making yourself feel better or or make a name for yourself. It, you've got to leave the ego out of it. It's part of the main reason why we're not part of a team. I mean, it just did not work for us. Um, when we go investigate, it's because we're going for that experience, because we have questions, because we want to learn. And unfortunately, in our experience, it was more about egos and the social aspect of it, that it was a night out and it was to hang out and stuff like that. And unfortunately, I think that happens more often than not. So ego, you've got to let go of it. it, it there, I, I don't think there's any place for that. But that's my opinion. You know, that's, again, one of the reasons why I am very glad we're not part of a team. Uh, Rob from Living Paranormal posted in chat saying that he lost his ego in his first divorce. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, it happens. Um, but, uh, you know, I'm, I'm glad you bring up ego because that actually uh, is a nice segue into the second part of our show tonight, which um, I briefly had mentioned it in the conversation <laughs> and interview with uh, Professor Auerbacher about um, the uh, idea of haunted locations and, and greed and so on and so forth. So, um, you know, it, Doing this show and being within the paranormal, I, I'm pretty sure if you are an avid listener of it, uh, you know that Lucy and I are passionate in what we do. And we are passionate in the field itself, in, in the idea. And we, yes, we do have curiosity. Uh, we, do our, we are curious about the paranormal and about finding answers and being truthful and honest. And that is what we set forward in our shows every single week, and in what we do in our investigations, everything is truthful and, and honest. There is there's no bullshit at all that Lucy and I put forward. If it's not there, we say it's not there. If it is there, we say it's there, but we also even question it. Even Lucy makes fun of me saying I always have a skeptical eye on things, and I'm always analytical, and you know I, I always run through things before I believe it. Yeah, it's true. That's the way I am. That's my personality. But that's what makes me passionate about this topic and about this field. I love it. It is what I will do for the rest of my life, whether I'm on the radio, whether I'm on uh, as a partner with Lucy in this or not. It is what I'm going to do till, till I die, till I find the answers myself. Um, and so we are very passionate about this. And, you know, when, when I notice things that happen around us and sometimes in inclusion with us, it uh, it disturbs me and it gets me very upset and very angry to the point where I have to say something. 
you know, uh, there are a lot of things that have happened in the course of this radio show and in the course of, uh, you know, being friends and being a partner with Lucy in uh, 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 this paranormal crime that we commit every single week and every single uh, day of the year. You know, there. I'm losing track of my thought here, Lucy. You got to keep me on track, but. Um, you know, we, we, we take things seriously, but there are things that happen, and there are sometimes things that, that do happen that you guys don't even know about. You know, I bite my tongue, or Lucy bites her tongue, and we move on. Um, we don't like to sort of dwell on, on stupid, petty, you know, TMZ gossip crap that happens. We, we tend to not like to do that because it almost sounds a little bitchy at times. Um, but when something big happens, and it involves us, I have to say something. I really do. I have to, um, and I want to, because it not only educates myself and instills the passion that I have and validates the passion that, that I have, but it, it can also educate you as a listener who is listening in. It can also educate you on what to look out for or 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 maybe have your own opinion about. So, I'm going to read. I, I actually was debating this week on whether or not I just talk about this off the cuff and, um, and and get into a discussion about that, or if I just write a statement and read off of that. And you know, if you know me, I tend to sort of babble and go all the way around the bush and then come back again to make the point. And so I didn't want to bore people with it. And I wanted to make sure that I, I got what I wanted to say out to everybody and, and made it as professional as I could because I may go off on the deep end and I may I may not be so nice to, to, to make it simple. So, Lucy, if you'll allow me, I've got uh, a statement that I wanted to say to, to you and to everybody who's listening um, about what ticked me off this week. Is that Okay. Go right ahead. Okay. Here we go. We had a guest on our show that discussed a recent purchase of a haunted home that he and his group of people had been investigating and researching. There had been some live investigations done so that the public can view it as well as private investigations in which he and his team conducted. As a result of all these investigations and research, he stated on our show and on other shows that he is not opening the home for public investigations. He stated that the house has evil or demonic activity and the safety of the public is foremost on his mind. He felt that he could not expose the public to the home for fear of groups or teams getting hurt, or worse, having some sort of entity possess or cause internal mental harm. Now, I respect anyone that says this. When he stated that on our show, both Lucy and I believed he was sincere and that he had the public safety and well-being in mind although I still would have liked to investigate the home, just as I'm sure hundreds of others would have as well. There was an intrigue to the home because of this. Let's now fast forward to eight days after our live show with this guest. After about a week after our show, this same guest posted online a fundraising site. In the first paragraph of the fundraising site, it stated, and this is not the exact words, that they were planning another live online investigation in which viewers can watch another investigation that they will conduct and that they were looking for monetary help in putting this program together and online. Now, no one has to tell me that what goes into putting together a production. You know, this radio show is certainly not free for Lucy and I, nor are the live investigations that we do at Haunted Locations and Broadcasting so that anyone who wants to listen in and also participate can do so freely and in the comfort of their own home. I know it costs money, money I wish was being supported by ads or commercial spots. Lucy and I decided that from the very beginning of this radio adventure, we would not bore our listeners with the constant interruptions of local commercials to fund our show. This is what we chose to do. This is a passion of mine and a passion of Lucy. Why would we expect anyone who is innocently tuning in to pay for my passion? If it ever came to that point, I would close up shop and continue doing what I do in the paranormal world, which was the same before I came on air. So I get why people ask for donations or funding, but it's just not something I would personally do. And I don't have a problem with that, and I don't have an issue with, with this guest we had on the show posting a fundraising site for that, to each their own. But, and this is a big but, the second part of that paragraph stated that whomever donated a certain amount of money or greater 
would be eligible to enter a raffle of some sort or be in consideration to actually come to the haunted house and participate in the investigation with them. Now that I have a problem with, and that is what you call a hypocrite. That is what you call someone who is talking on two sides of their mouth, stating they don't want to open up their home for fear of everyone's safety and how it's full of evil or demonic activity, but yet, if you donate a certain amount, you can come and investigate with them. I have to apologize to you listeners. We had brought someone on the show that we thought was sincere and not like some of the other greedy, misguided location owners out there. We believed him, and we believed his sincerity and portrayed it to you as true. I apologize for doing that, and I apologize for allowing your views or your opinions to be swayed because of how we portrayed this person in the paranormal world. I should also add to this that after the live show with this guest, our Facebook page was messaged by this person, and we received lashings from him because we had a surprise guest on the show after his interview stating the surprise guest's opinion of the home. We debated the surprise guest's integrity and truth and statement to make sure we aired both sides of the coin to you, the listeners, and that we also put this surprise guest through a series of questions to find out what he said can be backed up with evidence. The surprise guest could not, and we sort of showed that to the guest that we had nothing to worry about. Now, remind you, this surprise guest we had on after our guest had made their statements in an online newspaper, which had been published almost a month before we had our show with this guest. So it had been in the public's eye for several weeks now. The messages that we received from our guest proceeded to state that we were wrong for having the surprise guest on and that we only did it to discredit him and to cause trouble to gain more listeners. After explaining the truth to him, he still did not get it and ended the message with nothing of real substance. You know, this isn't the first time, like I said, that we received hate mail from a guest, and I frankly don't care. I don't care because obviously we said something or we did something that was not in your quote-unquote bigger plan, which obviously was to seem sincere but then ask for money and put people in jeopardy, as you originally claim would happen if anyone from the outside came into the home. I am so tired of people who claim to be for the people and be for the paranormal and only for the research and want fans or followers to be with them on this journey and then do something like this. You want money? Go the normal route and get sponsors. <clears throat> you want to be in a, a production company? Then get investors and start a real company. Don't state the house is active with demonic activity and state you can't see allowing anyone to enter the home and then only days later ask for donations, and dangle the carrot of entering the home to investigate in the hopes of filling your bank account for anyone who would give a certain amount. People may, ask, people may actually say that this is pretty shitty of me to state and expose someone like this. I say to them, you are allowed your opinions as I am allowed mine. This is my opinion. No names were said and no locations were stated. I'm not asking anyone to do anything from my little soapbox announcement. I'm simply stating my thoughts on certain things that piss me off, and sharing them with people who may be thinking the same. If you don't ag agree, then that's your prerogative. I'm not doing anything to hurt you. In fact, I'm hoping to help the community by cleaning up some of the messes so that we can play in a nice and clean environment. We're all out for the same thing, answers to the afterlife, and our show is called Paranormal Review, not Paranormal Judgment. I'm not here to judge, just state the obvious. We all have a higher being, or some universal entity, or maybe just our own afterlife conscious that will be answered to, not me. So thank you for listening, and I hope everyone understands my heartache in this. I'm fired. I agree. <laughs> no, 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 no. We talked about this, and when you brought it to my attention, it really did strike a chord because... You can't, on one hand, claim that there is things that will hurt the public. You can't sit there and say, no, I'm not going to bring anybody in for fear of anyone getting hurt. But yet, on the other hand, it's almost like it's, it's, it's an afterthought. It's almost like a little contest where it's like, okay, well, you know what? If you pay me, I'll let you in. There's mm -hmm. something inherently wrong with that. Um, what happened to the concern for someone getting hurt? 
what happened to the concern for something that could possibly happen to somebody. Um, it's disappointing to see something like that. It is disturbing to see something like that. And I think it's totally irresponsible to even do something like that. So, you know, personally for me, I have a great distaste for people that do ask for money. Like you said, what we do, we choose to do. We pay our own way. There's no reason why I should ask anyone who listens to us to support monetarily what we choose to do. This is something that we choose, that we're doing, that we pay for. Um, well, I don't. I don't want anyone to get the, the, the misunderstanding uh, of those two points that I was making. You know, uh, yes, you know, we don't air commercials. We don't ask for money. We don't put up a fundraising site and say, you know, please help me because I can't pay the rent. But I give you a good show every week and you give me some money. No, we don't do that. That's not us. That's not what we do. But there are some people that do do that. Morally, is that right? Or ethically, is that right? Mm, maybe not. But, you know, who am I to judge? I'm not to judge that person. They can do whatever they want. It's a free world. It's a, they have free will to do anything that they want. And if there are people out there willing to give money for that aspect, then that's fine. But what pissed me off and what gets me upset is when you're a hypocrite and when you talk about being uh, a, a location owner, a haunted location owner, and I specifically, and I, I don't know if it was myself or you, but in, in any case, we ask the question of, of this person, of this guest, Will you invite people in? Will you invite groups in? And he said no, not at this time, because he needs to do more research. It is, it is too active, and he is concerned about the welfare of people going in there. And then eight days later, literally eight days later, there's a post on a page, and it's stating that if we give money and donate, and it was such a little amount of money, too, to, to, to him to put on this show – his online uh, live investigation show. But if we give a certain amount or above, we may be eligible to actually investigate and participate as well and be there. And they, they, they in, inviting you to the home. It, it did state that they're not going to pay for any travel expenses, so that meant that they want you to be at that home. Not matter of participating in the investigation where you are at your comfort of your own home, and you may be calling in like Lucy and I do when we do investigations. No, they're actually calling you to come into the, the investigation. If you give X amount of dollars, you can come in with us. Where did the whole talk about your being and your welfare and your, your, your sanity and, and the hazards that you just talked about, where did that go? What window did it fly out of and how quickly did it fly out of? Were the dollar signs there in your eyes and that's why you couldn't see anything else? That's what pisses me off. I agree. I agree. No, it, it is – that's that, – you know, like, as I was saying about the money part, I mean, that's my personal feeling. Um, I have a problem with that. But you're right. It is the sense of, on one hand, you say, I don't want anybody to come in because I don't want anyone to get hurt. But right. yet, like you said, eight days later, all of a sudden, here it is. You know, if you give a certain amount of money, you too can be, you know, in this home. What changed? Does the dollar make it all of a sudden it's safe to bring someone in? That's the question. And 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 I'm not even I'm not even debating or or expressing any comment or opinion or anything of the of the matter of whether or not the house the location is haunted. It very well may be. You know, I'm I'm not talking about the validity of the home itself. I'm talking about the homeowner. I'm talking about the actions that this homeowner has done. And and that is what is pissing me off. I don't want people to misinterpret me and say that I, I was bashing the, the homeowner and I was saying that the house is not haunted. No, I'm not saying the house is not haunted. It very well could be. And in fact, I think it is because of the little research that I did on the home. And if you look, you know, if you remember the show that we did, I actually brought up some information that I found that the homeowner did not know about or, or knew about but knew very little of. And so, you know, I, I believe the house. I believe in the house. I don't believe in, in the homeowner and the actions of what this homeowner is doing. 
that is is where I draw the line. And when you bring in people who are when when you you create something where you're bringing in people that may cause harm or it may cause what you have been hyping up to be this unbelievable uh, I, I don't want to say demonic, but this unbelievable bad or or evil entity or entities that are are still roaming in those halls of that home, it, you you're bringing in, them into that because you just donated fifty dollars and now you just won the raffle. I, 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 are you putting a price tag on someone's life? I, I don't I don't I don't get it. You know, I, I just don't understand how that works. But yet. We were wrong when he started to email us on our Facebook page and message us and tell us that we were completely wrong, that, that, that we ambushed him, that, that we set this all up, and how unethical we are. I, I, I'm laughing so hard at that inside right now, but the anger is showing forward first. Well, I mean, honestly, I mean, it's like, well, I, I still don't understand where you know, that part of it came from, you know, that we ambushed or, you know, we were trying to discredit. That's not what we were trying to do. What we simply did was we wanted to talk to the person who had an article out where he questioned, you know, whether or not there was activity. In my opinion, he didn't prove anything. Right. Right, and we we showed it. we showed it completely. We showed that yeah. he didn't do it, and and I even pointed out to him in my message back to him when he was lashing out at us that we even we even got that surprise guest to say, you know what, maybe I was wrong in saying that. Maybe I was a little premature in mm-hmm. saying that. He admitted to that on the on the air with us. So what did we do wrong in that manner? How were we unethical? We're not, and I still don't understand where where all that came from. I mean, I don't think anybody was discredited. I don't think the house was discredited. The whole problem with this whole situation is just the fact that if this house, in your opinion, as an owner, you say that it is too dangerous to let somebody in, what changes in eight days that you can offer a raffle to let just anybody in? I mean, who are you bringing into the house? First off, there's a responsibility to bring, you know, if you're going to bring someone into the home, that it is someone who obviously is knowledgeable, that's not going to get hurt. But here mm-hmm. we are, it's all based on monetary. You know, whoever pays, here we go to the highest bidder. Mm-hmm. You you could walk in the house. That doesn't show any responsibility to me. That doesn't right. show any responsibility to the public. If, if if my four year old niece donated a thousand dollars to 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 this fundraising thing, are, are they going to allow her in there? According to she, according to what's posted, she would. If be she wins the raffle, then she gets to go. But yet, you're talking about a place where you've already said that there's something dark, there's demonic activity. And then again, here here's that 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 label demonic. I mean, you know sensationalism let's let's call it a demon let's call it you know let's make it all sound big and bad i mean these are all well, I, things I, I i i don't want to get into the validity of, of the house and, and there very well could be demons they're very you know yes that word is used around a lot you know <laughs> just just like you know the old joke everybody says i love you all the time yeah that's it's thrown those words are thrown around so many times and in and, and so many uh, situations that it sort of loses its meaning after a while. But yes, it, it could be. It, it, there could be some sort of level of demonic activity. There could be some evil or bad entities in there. Yes, there could be. I'm not judging or I'm not being opinionated in regards to the house itself because, you know, I have heard stories and like I said before, I have done research. I think it is. You know, I would love to, yes, would I still love to go into that house? I, I would. That's my foolishness. I would love to still go in this house. I would not go in there if this is still the owner, but I, I still would love to go to that house and, and see see for myself what is going on. I, 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 I have the problem with how this was conducted. You know, if, if this happened six months from now or a year from now, 
And it was predicated to the, to the point where, yes, there was more research done, there were more investigations done, there were more people with education beyond our realms that came into that home and um, it, it, it came to conclusions of X and Y and Z and felt that it was okay to open up the home to the public and for groups and teams to come in there and investigate. I can understand that. What is is boggling my mind is you just said it eight days before and now all of a sudden you're able to open it up to a lucky winner who donates money that I don't get what 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 happened in those eight days where 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 did the morale go um, the, the morality of this the ethics of it all where did that all go I, I, I don't know, but, it, you know, it, as, I, as I talk about uh, with, with uh, coworkers of mine and friends of mine about the Malaysian Flight 370, there's so many, you know, weird scenarios that are popping up and evidence that I don't know if it's true or not. And I think there could be sort of, quote, unquote, conspiracy theories that are true out there. And so I'm not getting the whole picture. I don't understand it. And I, I sort of am applying it to this. I, I, I'm not getting the whole picture. What's behind this? Is is there another agenda that you have? Is is there something that you're building up to? Are you you know, you, do you want a movie out of this whole deal? It, it, you know, do do you want to at some point maybe in a year from now charge five thousand dollars to a group that come to come into that home because of of everything that's been going on or or you know the the sort of carrot that you've been dangling in front of it? I I, I don't know, but there's there's I don't know if there is anything or if there's not. But there's something that's not right about this whole thing. There's just something missing that I'm not hearing or I'm not seeing, and maybe that's why I'm being frustrated enough and I'm not getting the whole picture on. No, I agree. I agree 100%. I just find it funny. I, I just don't understand. And, and as again, like I said, if on one hand you do say that there's something in there that you don't want to let people in, I think it's just kind of irresponsible just to allow somebody in just because they're the highest bidder. Or or say, okay, maybe miraculously something in the eight days did happen. You know, maybe there there was additional research that was done. And, and you know, it could happen. I don't know. Maybe something came and, and, and understandably that, you know, now that they can. Then predicate it then predicate this fundraising and explain in this paragraph that you've written out wanting money, explain. We've done research, and yes, I know I have talked about it not being open to the public for fear of everyone's well-being and, and blah, 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 blah. Um, but we found it to to be okay now, and uh, we think we're we're we're, um, uh, we're, we're we're good to allow for the public to come in, but yet, you know, you do have to sign a waiver because you know fully well that you are entrusting yourself in this predicament. If anything happens, you are liable and we're not liable. You know, predicate it all. Talk about it beforehand. Explain the situation. But for you to come out and then just say, we're doing another paranormal live investigation on air, online, and we need money to put the show on, and so we're asking for, for donations. And also, if you give a certain amount, you can be a lucky one to actually participate and investigate with us. And that's it. To me, that's not right. To me, that's not right at all. No, because, you know, if you read the paragraph, there's not much in there. There's really not much in there at all. There's no explanation. There's no no change in situation. Um, it, it's just all of a sudden, you know, be the highest bidder and you two can go. I don't know. You know, I'm reading chat in between my rants. Um, and, you know, I, again, I apologize for having this guest on the show. It, it you know, I, I, I thought that that what was going on was pretty sincere, and I, I thought it was um, uh, an interesting topic. And um, obviously, it was in the forefront of the news, online news, and, the, and within the local community, and uh, within the paranormal groups itself. And, and so, you know, obviously, that's something that we want to talk about. We want to bring on air and have our listeners, you know, hear and 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 be a part of. And so. Um, we had him on the show, and, and I thought, we thought he was sincere enough, and, and we believed in what he was saying. 
And so I, I want to apologize for, for putting that forward to you guys and, uh, you know, uh, having you formulate your opinions uh, about him or about the paranormal maybe. I don't know what happened or transpired uh, after or during our interview with him on your end, you the listener. So uh, I, I do want to apologize for that. And, I, and I'm not expecting anyone to change their opinions uh, I, I don't want to do that. If you do, that's fine. That's that's you know, it's your life. That's what you do. Um, but I'm not here to do that. I'm not here to to, to gain supporters or, or or to create a lynch mob. I, I I don't want to do that. I just want to educate everybody enough to. Here's the truth. This is what is happening. This is what has happened to us. This is what we noticed. This is what we found out. And so, just be cautious. Be wary. Understand what the reality of it is, and you make up your own decisions. You make up whether or not you want to continue, um, um, you know, sort of being a, a viewer uh, of that, or, or you, if you want to donate or whatever, you have that option to do what you want. You know, I'm not going to judge anybody for that, but I just want to, again, and it's so funny how it goes along with this whole topic tonight, it's educating. It's getting that education out to everybody so that they understand and they make an educated uh, answer. They give an educated answer to whatever question pops up in their mind. Well, I think the other part about it is is that you can't just blindly accept without asking questions. Part of the education is asking questions asking the right questions. If a mm -hmm. question comes up, don't be afraid to ask. That's the only way that you're going to learn. And if you do have a question about something, which both of us had the same question when we saw this, you know, I think it's I, I think it's within my right as a student of the paranormal to ask these questions. I have a question about it. I really do. I'm confused. I, I don't understand. It's not a matter of discrediting anybody. It's not a matter of 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 downing your message. It's just I just have a question. What changed in so short a time? And I also want to do add as well because along with that guest, um, um, there 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 was another guest with him that is affiliated with him, um, a female. And and I again I don't want to say any names or anything, but we don't. There, there's no issue or there are no issues that we have with this female guest that we had on. We actually do love her. We like her, um, and we think she's doing a great job. And uh, what she does, we think, is is, is phenomenal. Um, and so there's no issue with, with that female guest. It is only the, the owner of this location is the point that I'm bringing up tonight and is the, 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 the issue that I wanted to address and, and bring to everybody's attention. Agreed. Agreed. Um, like I said, there's questions that came up, and this was just one that I, I'm very glad that you brought it up, and I'm glad that we addressed it. You have no idea. When, when I came across that um, earlier this week, uh, you, you have no idea the fire that was raging in my chest. I do. <laughs> just reading that. Just to, <laughs> I mean, if 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 my eyes could pop out of my head, they probably would have at that point. But the the heat that was coming off of my chest when I was reading that, I, I could not contain myself. I could not control myself. And and then I also debated. I said, you know what? Should I tell Lucy? Because I know Lucy would probably go crazy. Um, uh, do I hold on to it? Do do I not say? It? Do I say anything online uh, on the radio show? Do I not? You know. And I was debating it for for a good time, a good while. But uh, you know, it, it, uh, it all came down to what's what's for the better for everybody. You know, am I better for knowing it? Hell yes. And so uh, I, I think, if anything, I think our listeners and and people who are fans of the show and, and who religiously, you know, come to our Facebook page and who are a part of the super fans page that we have, you know, are, are, are good, close, dear friends that we have within the paranormal, all of you out there, and you know who you are. I don't have to name your names. Um, you know, would that education help them and would that knowledge help them? Yes. Hell yes. I think so, too. Um, and so that's why I, I, I've done this and that's why we're doing this right now. 
Otherwise, I don't like to do a bitch fest. I really don't. I hate this part of it. I really do. I hate it. I wish there was nothing that I had to report or there was nothing that I had to discover. I hate doing this. Um, and again, like I said before, we do find things out, you know, little things here and there that just piss us off and that's not right for the paranormal community. But as a whole, I, I sort of weigh it and judge it in, in my own mind. Is, is it really that detrimental to talk about? No, it's not. So I let it go. People will find out on their own. It's not really anything that could be harmful to anyone. It's just stupidity that we find within the paranormal world and within the paranormal community. But something like this, to me, I think is detrimental to someone's health and well-being. And so uh, I, I wanted to bring it to everyone's attention and to caution everyone that if they are going to do it, at least know the facts. At least, at least know what is going on behind the scenes. That's all. Well, I mean... Oh my God! On on a normal basis, how many things do we come across that we find that we question, but yet we never say anything about? I mean, because that's not that's not what we want to do. We not we don't want to come on every week and and like you said, it's not a bitch fest and it's not it's it, it's not a, a a lynch mob or anything like that. I mean, there are things that we see on a daily basis that happen within the paranormal that we question or that rub us the wrong way. But we never say anything about it. You know, this just happened to be something that was really questionable. And, I, I, you know, I'm glad you brought it to my attention. I'm glad you said something about it. And I think now that we've said something about it, you know, you leave it for people to, to make their own opinion, and that's it. And that's it. <laughs> That's that's I mean that's it that's all that's all I really have to say and and I hope I didn't piss anybody off I I hope I didn't rub anybody the wrong way um, I, I I hope the point came out correctly and clearly and um, you know uh, your your faith in us is is hopefully um, you know risen a little bit more um, with what we just talked about so. Uh, again, I'm not doing this for ratings. Did we go all out in promoting and marketing this this portion of it? No, we we did mention something on our Facebook page and and on the um, I believe it was on the invite, but that was it. We only did it I think once, um, right? And, and that was it. So, uh, do, do we do things for for ratings and for listeners? No, I, I, no. I, that, I, we've that <laughs> is, oh my god. Um, see, now you're going to get me upset because. The one thing that I will not tolerate is when people say things like, oh, well, you know, you're doing this for ratings. No, we're not. And I don't know how many times we've said it, whether whether there's one person listening or there's a thousand people listening. That's not what we're doing this for. We are doing this as our way of communicating with others who think the same way. This is not for ratings. This is not for, I mean, even if we never had this radio show, Anthony and I would still talk about the same things. We would probably still be investigating. We would still be questioning. We would still be trying to learn. So none of this is being done for ratings, and that's the one thing that really does get to me. We're not doing anything for ratings. You know, you listen. Yeah, right. You Believe don't. me, if we were doing things for ratings, we would go, um, you know, sort of buck wild like the particular guest that we were talking about and go, uh, you know, a, a little crazy on our investigations like the guest that I was talking about. Um, <laughs> so, you know, I, I, we don't do that, you know, and, and, and good for them. They get ratings. They get, they get huge followers. That's great because, again, what Lloyd was talking about tonight is the scare factor. People want that in the paranormal shows. They, they want to be afraid in their living rooms and, and watch something for about an hour that gets them scared and they shut it off and they go to bed. You know, they want to be entertained that way. That's great. I, I, I'm not here, and I don't think Lucy is here as well, to entertain. Yes, we are here to entertain. But we're also here to talk about and find answers and research and educate and, and gain knowledge of and talk to people who know something or two about the paranormal so that 
we can take those aspects and what we learn and, and develop them into our investigations or in further research or or in talking with other people. That's that's what we do it for and that's what we portray. If it turns out to be entertaining for people, great. You know, but obviously, you know, we're not in it for the entertainment because, you know, we're not a coast to coast AM radio station. You know, we're not a darkness radio. We're, we're not we're not any of those folks that, that get the higher ratings or are in the FM stations or anything like that. Yes, we have been we've had the opportunity to do that. We've had we've been asked to do those things. Um, but you know, it, it, it's not we're not in it for that. And I'm I'm afraid to get into that because I feel as though that they're going to create something that is completely different, just like with mm-hmm. the editing of the paranormal shows. I don't want anything edited. We can simply be a part of a huger network of radio stations. Um, but what I find when that happens is the, the, the owners of the network stations have a say in what you put on and are, are, are in on some of the aspects of who you have on and what you talk about. And, and then, okay, you got to slip in this commercial and talk about that, that ad or this group of people, whatever it is. I don't want to get into that. I don't want to get into that. I don't want to be controlled. That's, that's when it really does become about the ratings. You right. you know, you lose control of what you're presenting because all of a sudden your network or whoever wants you to do this because of the ratings. And and that's again, that's not what we're about. I mean, when we broadcast a live investigation, it is because we want you to be a part of it. If mm-hmm. you never get to go to a location, here's your opportunity. If I couldn't travel, if I couldn't walk, if I for some reason was was stuck, I would be, and I have been glued to the radio or to the the to to the computer to hear and to see what's going on. And you know what? We've been very blessed. We've been very lucky. Every location that we've gone to. We've gotten activity. And I'm not saying that we're anything special. It's just that we have been lucky enough that every time we've gone somewhere, we've gotten something. It's not anything that we're staging. It's not anything that we're doing just to sensationalize. It is because we want to share this experience. And hopefully, if you listen to us, if you listen to our live investigations, you are getting part of that experience and that is part of what i mean i am so super excited about this next trip that we're taking i've Mm -hmm. never been to penhurst i have never been to this kind of place and the things that have been documented there i want to experience it and i want to be able to share that with our listeners so hopefully yes we will get something Hopefully, we'll be able to share it with you, and hopefully, you will enjoy what you're going to hear. You know, just to, um, you know, to to give a little understanding or a little bit more to what you were just talking about, about how we tend to be lucky enough to gain more evidence or gain more communication when we go on investigations, uh, live, on air, or not on air, um, I I think has to do, uh, you know, I I mean, maybe I want to believe it, but I, I think has to do with all of the research that we do prior to going to that location because Lucy and I roll up our sleeves and we dig in that dirt. We get into a, a lot of that information and a lot of the history behind it, and we use that in the communication. That's, the tool, that's most of the tools that we do use besides the equipment, um, but that's the major tool that we use when we go on investigations is that research, and I think that is what's helping to connect with a lot of the spirits on the other side because we know the information or we're able to convey a particular moment in time that they're going to remember and that it lends more of a a familiarity or comfort level with them that they're able to open up and talk to us. Also, too, I think it's because of the mindset, and we've talked about this before, that both Lucy and I have when we go into a location, the mindset is there to be open, to to have that communication, and not just there to have fun and, you know, okay, uh, let's start, you know, provoking this one or that one. No, we're there to do what we want to do, which is that communication, which is finding those answers, which is maybe even possibly helping someone, even just by communication. I physically can't help a spirit. I know that. 
But, you know, I, I think it has to do with a lot of the research, which, you know how funny this is? And again, this is what Lloyd was talking about before, about make, making sure that you educate yourself with it, within whatever it is and understanding it, and therefore that can help you grow further or or, or continue further on w within your investigations. Maybe that's what helps us, and, and that's why we get such good feedback and good communication and inter interaction with the afterlife. Um, I, or maybe it's just my wishful thinking on my part that all that hard work that we do is sort of paying off. I, I, I don't know, but I, I think that's that's the most important thing that uh, I wanted people to, to know, which could possibly be the reason why we get so much great experiences and, and evidence. Well, I know I can't wait until we get there, and I think it's going to be amazing. And every single one of you are invited to, to listen in and to join us that night. Yeah, so I, it's going to be in, in about two weeks, and um, like Lucy said, it, it's at Penhurst uh, Asylum in, uh, in Spring, Spring City, Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania. Right? Um, yep. yep, so Lucy's going to be flying in to me, and then we're going to be driving out to Pennsylvania on that Thursday. And actually, it's going to be on a Thursday night, guys. Um so if you want to take off a of work on Friday, go right ahead. Um, but uh, <laughs> uh, it, it, it's on a Thursday night. It's the only night that we can get Penhurst because they don't do an open. In, uh, they don't do any um, private investigations on a Friday, and I believe on a Saturday as well. Um, and we we really wanted to go there. So um, it's going to be on a Thursday night, and um, I think we're debating. And Lucy, you and I haven't talked about this yet, but maybe we may even do a. A, a, another show then on that Friday, the next day. Mm -hmm. um, since you'll be here in New York with me, we can do it together online. And I don't know if we talk about the place or we talk about anything else or we have a guest on. I'm not too sure yet. But look for that. I think, Lucy, we may do that invite pretty soon as well so that people uh -huh. put it on their, on their calendars. And like Lucy said, uh, it is basically for you guys who are listening. We want you to participate. We want you guys to to call in. We've had such great, phenomenal experiences with callers um, that have called in at a location that we've been able to put their voices in the location and do an EVP session with us. It's been really great and really phenomenal, and that energy that you bring is always great anyway. But to have you on the phone and have that additional person there with us, because um, it's only going to be Lucy and I, um, is going to be really great. So we're, we're inviting you out there with us, but not not physically. Um, so, uh, and it's going to be for free. There's no money. We're not asking for anything on this. So, um, look out for that invite that uh, we're going to be sending out. So, we've got about seven and a half minutes left, I think. So, let's see. Why don't we get on to the fan of the week? Okay. And this week, our paranormal review radio fan of the week is Corinne Bove Dimer Di of Power, Dimer. New York. Okay, some of her likes, she likes Stevie Nicks, Ghostbusters, Ghost Adventures, Conspiracy Theory with Jesse Ventura, and of course she likes Paranormal Review Radio. Congratulations, Corrine, and thank you for being a fan. I think you pronounce her name Corinne. Um, Corrine. So, Corrine. Cor Corrine. Corrine, 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 <laughs> we apologize for, uh, you know, butchering you your name, your but... Name uh, <laughs> Congratulations, Corinne. Uh, and don't forget, if you want to be a Paranormal Review Radio Fan of the Week, all you have to do is just like us on Facebook and maybe comment or two, a Paranormal Review Radio. Well, you heard it here first. Education is the key to any field, especially when it deals with the afterlife and the pursuance of the answers you crave. Be diligent but and be smart, but also be careful and be responsible. In the end, you are the one who has to live with your soul here on earth and beyond. We want to thank Professor Lloyd Auerbach for coming on the show and giving us a lesson in life and in the afterlife. We also so appreciate his time and commitment to the field. What a great guy he is. Anyway, talking about a great man, next Friday we have two great men on the show. One of our guests next week has been a fan of our show ever since the second or third show we've hosted, and that's over 125 shows ago. Wow. <laughs> yes, 
is none other than Mateo and the co-host of the great show, The Whatcast, along with Mike. Have you ever heard of the infamous case of the Mothman prophecies? Well, this legendary moth-like creature has been witnessed in Point Pleasant, West Virginia from 1966 to 1967, but has also been experienced for many years later. Is it a real phenomena, or is it just make-believe? Is it a prophetic element from another dimension warning us of disasters, or does it have a more evil intention? We're all attracted to this story like a moth to a flame, no pun intended. <laughs> so join us next Friday night for a crazy, real, somewhat weird discussion about the Mothman prophecies with Mateo and Mike. Thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight. And that includes all of you paranormal students out there. Thank you, Anthony, for making this so much fun. So until next week, parapeeps, keep searching for the answers. You never know where they may come from. Have a paranormal week. Good night. Good night, everybody. Paranormal.